So tonight we're really lucky to have uh, two really great guests talking to us uh, all about the marketing and the artwork uh, that powered the Acorn gaming scene. It's uh, Chris Payne and Mike Ellis. Um, so Chris was the marketing manager at two of the leading games companies of the day, Micropower and then later Superior Software, um, not just responsible for bringing some of Superior's biggest titles to market, including the Repton collection, um, but was also the brains behind some key design decisions as well, including things like the groundbreaking Repton level editor. And Chris uh, collaborated closely with our other guest, Mike Ellis, uh, who's a graphics designer and a founding partner of the uh, Ellis Ives Sproul Partnership, who produced some pretty iconic artwork back in the day for countless Acorn Games, marketing materials, adverts, um, a lot of which appeared in the leading Acorn magazines of the day, uh, like Micro User, Acorn User and a and Computing. Um, I think it's no exaggeration to say that their collaboration together transformed the face of games cover art and the marketing and advertising materials that went with it. And it provided a lot of the iconic imagery um, that literally had us reaching for the shelves in places like WH Smiths and elsewhere. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to this talk. I think it's going to be really good fun. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Chris now to, to kick things off. If that's all right, Chris. Fantastic. Thank you. So um, shall I start to share some screens, uh, yeah. Colin, and go through this presentation? I think so. I think that'd be good. Fantastic. So let me click on screen share. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Mm -hmm. So here's, uh, let me just step play. So this has been put together, this lovely slide by Dave to let you in on this, but it's um, been presented and associated with iDesign. I assume that's the correct pronunciation. Who's the publisher? publishers of the Acorn World in, World in Pixels book. And this is the copy that I have that sent myself and received. It's an absolutely fabulous looking book. And what you can see is I was involved with Mike with three of these on the left-hand side, which is Repton at the top, Citadel, Mystery, and the featured here. I also uh, was involved in the beginning of Thrust, which was published by Superior but I'd left um, Superior by the time we actually, uh, Superior actually published Frost. Onwards. So I also put together this photograph for uh, iZine, which is some of the stuff that I was involved with, which I'll be showing a little bit later. Here's me and Mike. So Mike is here on the call with me. Mike's on the right there with the very trendy glasses. I'm on the left. And it was when I flew out to see Mike a couple of years ago where he lives in the Isle of Man. Mike runs a fantastic media buying company over there and he's an incredibly creative guy. I get involved in working with consultants and accounts and solicitors creating books. Now, when you look, if you have the Acon in Pixels book, inside you'll see like articles or uh, chapters on the likes of Micropower, where, which quotes me, but also Mike. There's also a series of pages on superior software featuring me and Mike. And equally at the back of the book, there is a two page interview with Mike on page 418. So if you have the book, do go, especially if you've missed the interview with Mike, where he talks about some of the amazing stuff that he did to craft all these wonderful pieces of artwork and the advertising design as well. Now, when, after I started working at Micropower for a short period of time, this is where we moved to. So this is Northwood House in Leeds. So if you happen to be in the UK, you know Yorkshire, this is on a big main road and you may have passed it. So this is Micropower. The window in the first floor above the entrance is where Bob Simpson worked. All the software was on the first floor and the second floor. The ground floor entrance was a shop, a showroom. And you can see on the right hand side, a brochure 
for the hardware that we sold in the store, all the computers and software, BBCs, obviously, mostly. And we, of course, we had so many people coming inside. And if you go past the showroom, even today, on the back of the building, even though it is probably 30, 30, more than 30 years ago that MicroPower left, the MicroPower signage is still there at the back of the building. Now, if you were to go in the front of the building, this is what it would look like, the showroom. This is a color version when uh, before the, it was actually um, fully equipped. And this is what it looked very blurred. And the, the, there's a guy on the suit on the left-hand side there. There's two people on the suit. That is John Haig who wrote uh, Hell Driver. I think next to him in the middle of the image is Alan Butcher, who is the software manager for MicroPower and Program Power. And he evaluated a lot of the games and spoke with a lot of the programmers. On the right in the white shirt, I think is me. And then facing me, which is very blurred, I think is Bob Simpson's son, Andrew. And there's not many photographs around from the time, but you can see here MicroPower, Program Power, there's a Killer Gorilla poster in the background, which is now on sale. You may notice on, on the base there's an advert for Swoop. Um, and zooming in, the guy with the beard on the right-hand side with the Killer Gorilla t-shirt is Bob Simpson, the managing director of Microbound Program Power. The tall guy with the beard and the yellow t-shirt, which is also Killer Gorilla t-shirt, is Andrew Savage, who then went on to work with the likes of Dell um, from memory. And sitting down with his fingers intertwined is John Haig, the writer of Hell Driver. And Dave, if he was here, would actually tell us he did some other stuff as well, quite a few other little programs, but I think he's most famous for Hell Driver. And he was Bob Simpson's co-director. Now, when Program Power first started, the, the only way you would buy programs for about £10, like this 3D Oxo, was just literally a cassette with a tight instruction and an information sheet. There was no packaging. And then a year or so later, the packaging looks like it does on the left there. And you can see that Gomoku is typed on. So this was typed in the office by one of the team, it was Bob Simpson's brother-in-law, so his wife's sister's husband. And on the right there, Dave um, has put together a whole load of, of the initial packaging. And just looking at it, I can see things like Croker, Labyrinths of Lacoche, um, Escape from Moonbase Alpha and the rest before the packaging was created. And then before Mike Ellis got involved. And before I joined the company, this is what they had moved to, where you had a very simple illustration. If you look at that illustration, you might not be able to realize it, but it's very what I'd call two-dimensional. Although there's an element of 3D on the Caterpillar track building um, device, uh, what do you call it? Anyway, a Canon thing below it still doesn't look brilliant. And of course you've got these very two dimensional objects flying through the sky. And of course the top of the screen positron is actually written in just pure text. And I could just see how the R of positron is lower than the T. So it wasn't particularly well done. Yes, it wasn't a very professional packaging. And this was done by a company called Ralph Senior Associates. So when I came, joined the company, I just worked, been at Leeds Polytechnic doing a business studies degree. I went to interview Bob about the computer games market. He offered me a job there and then to, to be his marketing guy. So when I joined the company, Killer Grill, a lot like this, and I thought the packaging was awful and did the product a disservice. Well, I had bought an Atari 400 computer and saw all the software which was being imported from the States. And a lot of packaging in the UK was looking like this. But what I wanted to do was make it look more attractive. Now here is how it was advertised. And you can see even more 
that it's not really a very great gorilla. And the way that the, the girl is being held in the fist of this gorilla, it doesn't look real. It's like it's been dropped on, not very nicely done. So what I did, and this was a, about six months before Mike Ellis came on board, is I got the thing redrawn and drew what I wanted instead. And this is what it looks like. So on the left-hand side, you can see a far more realistic looking gorilla, far more drama in terms of it you know, tumbling, the whole thing tumbling down. On the right-hand side, the disc packaging. So if you look on the right side, and one of the reasons that I was able to twist Bob Simpson's arm was because we needed to go to disc versions of the BBC software. And that kind of previous packaging on the left there, I didn't think would look really great, you know, especially blown up much bigger to A5 size. So here we are again, the right hand side. I felt that was a far more compelling proposition. You'll see that the killer gorilla has a jaggedy edge around it that I wanted to give it far more flair. And so I was working my way into the business having just started. This was pretty much my first job ever. And if we now look at ghouls, you can see on the left-hand side, the packaging was pretty ropey with, that's very simplistic. You know, it's, it's all right, the image on the left-hand side. The advert that I put together, I was allowed to have the wiggly um, dual ghouls that was actually added there, but it wasn't particularly well done, the, the big illustration, because the, the, the corridor wasn't very, detailed. So what happened was that we brought in Mike Ellis and one of the first things that Mike did was go, to, was able to transform the image on the left just to get started where the left hand side had the floorboards not very exciting, the walls not very exciting and can transformed it on the right for the, the discs version and the Commodore 64 version where there's far more texture to the walls, to the floorboards, better cracking in the floorboards and repositioned the P, this, this pill that was there. He also, when he came in, actually, Mike, I should really let you jump in because here's me <laughs> racing ahead here. Do you want to say something about the work that you did to actually get started in all this? Well, I mean, you want me to, to do everybody wants to know how I actually got to meet you? I was going to say well, that was going to be my question. <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> yeah. How so, did you meet? Uh, you know, um, I was working uh, for a publishing company. I'd come out of um, art college, I'd done four years. Uh, I then specialised for the last two years in commercial design and marketing, advertising. So it's much, much more graphical. Uh, my, my hobbies at the time were playing computer games, basically, uh, although they were, you know, very basic. So, um, when I worked for the publishing company, I worked for them for a couple of years, and then I moved on to form a partnership with Les Ives and Stuart Sproul. And they were working for me at, at the time for the publishing company, which was Michael Bennett Associates. So we then moved into the building next door and formed our own little company. And whilst we were still doing their work, we found that we had some spare capacity, and I thought, well, it would be a good idea if we work for a computer game company because I, I like playing computer games. So I, I basically looked at all the magazines at the time, see who was advertising, who was reasonably local. So Leeds was fairly local to us. Um, and Micropower seemed to be the one that doing the most activity in the magazines. So I just picked the phone up and um, I got put through to Chris. And uh, I think I don't know, I don't know what I said to him, but I said, you know, can I come and see you with my portfolio? Um, I'm interested in doing some of this packaging and advertising. I've got an interest in computer games. And um, will you see me? You know, and uh, he did, and we got on great. From from then, it all went, you know, swimmingly, really. Well, what I'm doing is while you're speaking, Mike, I've just realised that I've got something I can actually share, which is. The pretty much the first job that we actually did. So I'm mm -hmm. just going to share the screen now. So let me just start this. Oops, I know what I've got to do. 
I have got to do screen share. So share screen and play. So when Mike came to see me, one of the first things he did was create this software catalog, which you can see here with some beautiful imagery that he did. So you drew this, Mike, you know, we, we together worked out mm. all the images from the games in the, when the packaging was still pretty ropey and yeah. you these, drew all this and created this wonderful catalog. We did about 150,000 copies. This version was- We did for, a lot, yeah, I remember. For, for WH Smith. Mm. Do you remember much about doing this, Mike? I do. I remember it being um, a, a very big print run. So I remember thinking, we need to get this right. <laughs> you know, the, if this goes wrong, um, it, it, you know, we were always talking about a huge print run because it was Smiths. And uh, in, in, in those days, you know, it, it was a big deal. And you couldn't put things right easily, even on the repro. So... And I'll show you what it looks like inside. And one of the reasons I took on Mike was because we'd done a previous version of this brochure and I didn't like it. I didn't think it was professionally done. And what Mike was promising was to set to produce them far better. And this is the kind of detail. And if you look down the spine there, you'll see a cat caterpillar, you'll see a wizard and a rat and so on. And he did all this and equally at the bottom of the screen there, he also designed the symbols for the Electron version, joysticks and the keyboard controls and all this, the meticulous amount of work and detail that was required to put this together was the reason I took, took you on, Mike, because this was just your bread and butter. And mm. you'd done something for like some kind of garden center with a train company or something oh something no that was work. we had worked for british rails rail riders club so it was a wow. children's club and we produced a magazine that was monthly and um of course we had a lot of cartoon work in it a lot of color artwork because kids you know they love all that kind of stuff so we were used to doing that type of thing um so we kind of transferred onto this and uh, it looks a little bit similar to the um, the children's magazine that we would have produced at the time. So based on what I saw there and our vision, you and I talking, this was the way that you got into the business, <laughs> which is producing this brochure. And here's the back cover. And again, the illustration, this, this new illustration work at the bottom to fill the area and the, the branch details and so on. And I say, I mean, we were producing easily 50 to 100,000 copies just to insert into the, the BBC micro user. There was probably another 75,000 yeah. went into Acon yeah. user. And then there was this WH Smith version, which was different because these were just the ones that WH Smith stopped, went into that. I think it was a six page version. This was a four page version. So there were hundreds of thousands of copies of this created. And as a result, you then got into improving some of the artwork. So on the left-hand side, this was how stock car looked on the left. And you can see on the red there of the, 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 um, the, the hood of the car, what was done by Ralph Senior Sources. And you can see that it's blurred. I don't mm. know why it looks so bad, but then it was redone by Mike Ellis and mainly Stuart Sproul as well, who was a whiz with the airbrushing and mike mike how did you how did you achieve that effect to turn the original image into something so sharp as the one on the right well just basically redraw the whole thing um from scratch uh you know obviously trying to keep it um it looking very similar to what was there before because it's, it's the same game but uh just basically upgrading the whole thing um so just taking longer and more care and we had an advantage really because I was doing the visuals and you know liaising with Chris so I was kind of doing a rough sketch of what I thought and we put our me and Chris had put our own ideas into it and then of course I'd go to Stuart Sproul and say right we need to airbrush this um if it's this particular one would have been just Stuart and myself and Chris but many of the others were Les Ives quite a lot with Stuart working on it as well with me doing the visual so you know you've got a lot more heads on it 
Um, so can I explain what the visual is, Mike? Well, a visual is a, is, is, is a colour sketch, basically. A, a colour sketch which is reasonably accurate to what you would expect to see the finished thing. And I used to do um, a visual with um, marker pens. And how so, long yeah, would it could... take you to actually do the initial visual? Well, the visual could, could, could take um, a few hours, you know, quite easily. It could take a full day. Um, and then but the visual was important to... because Sorry. that was the blueprint to how the artwork was going to be created. Um, and, a, and a visual, because it's, it's, it's kind of my sketch, can be easily altered. Um, it's not a, an expensive job to make alterations at that point. Um, once you get to artwork stage, so Stuart there has masked that up, he's airbrushed to get those smooth effects. If we wanted to make a change to it then, it's a, it's a world of pain then. <laughs> you know, um, you can't easily sort of scrub something out. Uh, you can make changes, but it's not as easy. The other thing, Mike, is what size physically was the visual? Was it mostly A4? Yeah, I mean, my visuals that I would bring in to you would only be pretty much the same size. You know, um, there's no point doing it any, any bigger, whereas the artwork would be a lot bigger. It'd be two or three times as big. Four ta effectively, four times the size, yeah. wouldn't it? So yeah. if we look on the right, this image on the, on the right-hand side, which is... This is like the, the advert on the back of a magazine. Yes. The original image was four times the size of a magazine. In other words, it was four of those. It is yeah. double, but it's effectively four of those together. Mm. Whereas this image on the left was probably like actual size. So it's a fraction. So that's yeah. why when it's reproduced, it probably wouldn't look that good. Yeah. It never really... It would never look sharp. Uh, it would always look blurred because the print process was you know, a little bit primitive compared to what we've got nowadays. And so, you know, you had to, to make things look sharp and detailed. You had to work quite large on quite large size so that the scanners of the day could capture as much information as possible. The scanners now that scan an image are far superior to what was, you know, a £150,000 scanner back in the 80s. So... um we know We're looking, things going have come back on a lot. 40 years, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Mm. So now we can switch now to the packaging. So on the left was how the, the BBC version was. And on the right, well, this happens to be the Commodore 64 version, but it's the same for the BBC, the BBC disc. You can see which would you more likely to buy. So this was a persuasion process. I had to persuade the managing director of Micropower, Bob Simpson, to go from what was on the left that he was happy with for a couple of years to mm. say, look, if we go and spend more money with Mike, because that meant an additional cost. But I managed to persuade uh, Bob to say, look, trust Mike. And we, if we produce what's on the right, yeah. not only will it look more attractive for the Commodore 64 version, but we'll sell a lot more of the BBC cassette version. Absolutely. And also we're going yeah. to have sell a lot of the BBC disc version. Yeah. 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 I mean, it just stands to reason. To me, it's very obvious. And to you, it's very obvious. But, it, you know, it, it seems daft now that you have to persuade people to do this. Yeah. You know, for a small investment to get a big return, you know, it, it, it continues to surprise me how people, even today, don't regard marketing that important. You know, some people, not everybody. And the other thing is, it's worth pointing out that for most people watching this will look at the left and the right and say, yes, the one on the right is far better. But actually, there's still a, a percentage of people who don't see the difference, that it actually makes a difference, but it really does. Mm. I'm going to now go on to something else which is interesting, and it, co it covers off a number of areas. At the top on the left there is a game called Seamus, which is out for the Atari S, for the Atari 400. And on the right at the top, you can actually see what the game looks like. Now, when I went to work for Micropower, and program power, I owned this game, Seamus. So when Micropower said, let's go into the Commodore 64 market, 
and also do some stuff in the BBC as well. I said, let's do a copy of Seamus. And that became Cybertron Mission on the bottom left. Yes. Mm. So we were copying ideas. And you can see on the right hand side of the bottom there, the game Cybertron Mission. And pretty much it was a clone. But it came out of my understanding of what was selling well in the States and stealing the ideas from that market. Now, the other thing to point out as well, because we were obviously the whole business was about nabbing ideas and copying arcade machines is on the left hand side here was the packaging for Cybertron Mission. If you look at the man who is shooting the gun on the lower left hand side, I happen to be in the in the offices of Ralph Senior Associates who did the pack this packaging. And I there was a copy of 2000 AD, a comic, and that drawing of the man with the gun had been literally lifted absolutely precisely from this comic and actually been colored in. So in the comic, it was black and white, but on the front cover of this game, it was colored in. And somehow we got away with it. So we could have had, you know, um, somebody at 2000 AD say, oh, you have stolen that yeah. graphic. But basically they were too busy to even bother noticing and we got away with it. So onward from there, what I wanted to show was what Mike did because that was the graphic on the left. So now let's see what Mike and his team did where they took, it, 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 basically Mike convinced Bob Simpson and Mike, I said, look, we can duplicate because it's like a duplication, just improving. Our cost is less and we'll do it. You probably did it as a discount because yeah. you did so many of them, but hopefully people can see the attention, the extra detail that was added to the image on the left, it was redone to create the image on the right. So he literally, Stuart mostly did this, I would imagine. Yeah, he would have done, A bit yeah. of brief from you, Mike. But yeah. you can see a lot more. It's a bit like spot the difference. But mm -hmm. the... I've been the, playing that, just looking at it. <laughs> yeah. So I say again, Colin? I've been playing that, just looking at it, looking at yeah. the arm, the boot. You can see the little yeah. details that are added. Well, you in. can't even see the ghost on the other one very well at all. Mm -hmm. But so you added that contrast because you understood the reprographic process far mm. better. You understood the law of contrast. You know, it was probably done far bigger, you know, far bigger than scale down, which made all the difference. So what we had on the right was this was what I effectively launched into the Commodore 64 on cassette and on disc. And what became the, the BBC disc version packaging was what was on the right. And we may have done that, I haven't looked on the internet to see if we actually changed the cassette version as well. But this was the kind of thing that I did in the 18 months that I was at Micropower before I left. And again, here's another one where on the left was the Phoenix in the factory, which was how Bob launched it. And then on the right, once Mike and I got our fingers on it <laughs> and again it was completely redone it looks like it's been improved like it's been traced over and improved but we've uh, looked at this in detail and it's actually a completely new piece of artwork so you must have cut a deal mike to have done all these redraws well it's a lot easier to do a redraw because i'm not creating a, an original piece when i'm doing you know there's no need for a visual hardly a need for a visual on that one there you know, we're having to copy something. It just made the process easier. I mean, it might not be what we would have come up with originally. We may have done something a lot a lot nicer, but we were stuck with that, and we had to make the best of what we had. And um, so people are still recognise it as the same game, but, it, but, but it's a lot nicer, yeah. 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 Now, the other thing to point out, because, and just to give a gap, if you look on the packaging on the right-hand side, you know, it says Felix in the factory, but there's a black area below the X. Well, that was done deliberately. We didn't fill that with detail because that's where the wording had to go for the description of the game for the advert. Yes. Mm. So when we're crafting packaging, we want the packaging to work in a whole, it has to work for cassette and disc, 
It also has to work for adverts where there's wording on and a series of screenshots. So we're, we're doing both things at the same time. That's worth saying. Now, here's where you really started to do stuff as well, Mike. Yeah. With this one, which was an original, where this has never been done before. This game was on, on the left. It's just yeah. what the game looks like. On I the remember left, drawing this came right from scratch. <laughs> from scratch, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can see how you've elaborated and you and Stuart have elaborated on these little pixels on the left-hand side mm. to create what's on the right-hand side. Yeah, 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 it's exactly the same as the graphics on the babies. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then, but what the other thing that's worth pointing out, in case we say it, what we can see there is that June Rider, the writing was done separately. Mm. So there were two pieces of artwork. So you've got the artwork with the illustration without the word micropower, without this, obviously, the BBC model be disk software, of course, but June Rider was a separate piece of artwork that was provided separately. So the illustration itself would be effectively four times, four A4 sheets of paper. And then the June Rider writing would be an A4 cup card on its side. And mm. then that would be dropped on at the artwork stage. Yes, Mike? At the repro stage, yeah. Exactly. So I do an overlay with that on and with, the, with, with instructions to the repro house on how it was supposed to um, lay on the artwork and how it's supposed to merge. You know, everything. This is what took time. Is You did the artwork and then you had to do a list of instructions uh, to the repro house so that they could make the films. The, the 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 four color separation films, which was all hand work. I mean, it was. I mean, as you, we talked about this on a quick run through yesterday, was mm. one mistake, yep. one tiny mistake, and you had to the cost to yep. fix that mistake. You had to start again amazing. with the films. Hmm? You had to start again with the films. You have to yeah. start replanning the films, and you know, you need to make another set of films, and then of course. We talked about um, the final thing before you see the, the finished printed job or the finished advert in a magazine. We have to produce a proof because it's too risky not to produce a proof. And the proof was called a chromalin proof. So it was like a colour photograph. Now, this was done with four powders and films. And I don't know the correct process, but basically these... Each colour was put down separately, and this powder adhered to a surface. So you'd, you'd do four of these, a cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And there'd be like a little film overlay on each one, and eventually it sort of crush itself down into one image, which looks like what it would look like when it's printed. And that, that took ages to do. And that would be the thing that I would take to Chris and say, this is the last chance, last possible chance that you've got to see this before we send the films off to the publisher. And, you know, once it's published, you can't change a thing. Mm. So there was always this um, air of anticipation of, oh, my God, let's hope that then nobody finds anything wrong with it at this stage. <laughs> Exactly. Well, I think what we used to do is make uh, our clients sign something that at each stage that they checked it, they checked it before we went to repro, that they checked it carefully before we went to Chrome and improved. So, you know, we we may we put the emphasis on the client to double check everything that is presented to them. Yeah, I think I remember signing a piece. It was a, like a rough photocopy with various tick boxes to yeah, check something and like that, autographed yeah. it. And then just equally, protect us because it's so expensive to put right that, you know, we'd, we'd end up going out of business. <laughs> exactly. And then I'd get Bob Simpson to sign it off as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, it's just worth pointing out, if you look at there's a spaceship on the right-hand side and that there's a gap before the moon, and that's deliberate because that's where the wording has to go to describe what this game is that would make the back cover 
advert that would go on the back cover of the micro user and Acon user and A and B yeah. computing and maybe inside the likes of computer video games and your computer and stuff like that. Onward. Another um, very close uh, re- um, visualization of what was on the left, just simply transferred <laughs> into something pretty on the right. I think I think it's worth saying, isn't it, Chris, that actually the, it's the artwork that fires the imagination. So when you do play a game like that, even though it looks like that on the left, because you've got that picture in your head of the, the cover yeah. art or the advert, it somehow makes the game feel like, no, that really is what you're playing, even though literally <laughs> what's on the screen is not. Um, I think that's what's so powerful about it. Yeah, yeah. and the other thing that's you're worth, right. the worth pointing out, is if you look at this spaceship there, notice where our eyes are. We're actually, it is very similar to the beginning of Star Wars, where the point of view, the camera position is right on top of this enormous spaceship. And then if you look at the X, there's like a there's like the edge of like almost like a TIE fighter above the MIC of Micropower. Well, it's not actually separate, it's actually bolted on, but it's that X shape of an X wing. And then if you look at the word encounter, it's this angled in 3D shape, the word encounter, which sort of matches Star Wars. So you're using cultural reference points mm. at the time. And it's Mm -hmm. all part of the process. And it's not always done deliberately, but it's done subconsciously at the design process. Yeah. Worth bearing in mind. Mm -hmm. So here's, um, which you talked about before, is an original piece of artwork where you literally started from scratch. And equally, this is where you come in with with Les Ives. Yeah, there's a lot of Les's work in that. I mean, his style is so distinctive. Um, is very, very distinctive cartoon style. Um, so Les will have done the bulk of that, and then I can see where Stuart's come in, especially around the lettering. You know, he's done the airbrush work on Felix, on, you know, Evil Weevil. Yeah, so this is where we kind of scored a bit, because we could all... I did the visual for that, you know, I did the visual, and then Les and Stuart, so three of us worked on that job. Now, where this is worth pointing out, which it's very easy to miss, is if you look at the conveyor belt, you'll notice something. There's a texture to it. You can see that it's got a bump to it. It's very clear that it's rubber. When you look, it's a yellow rubber. But it, you can see with the curves above the blue barrels that there's a proper texture to it. It's not completely flat. And you can see the waviness above the blue wheels. And that's the kind of detail that you're, you're expecting. You don't notice it consciously, but and you notice the go, the, the, what do you call these um, movement lines be, behind characters, Mike? Do you have a word for them? Well, not really. I mean, there's this there's sort of a, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what you describe them as, um, but you see it a lot in comics and, and things like you that, you know. Mm. But it's clear which direction mm. the character is going. So you can see above the MIC of Micropower, there are a series of, there's a set of three lines behind his left shoe and then a two at the bottom of his left shoe. And then you can see below the caterpillar, there's two curved lines like a J and an I. And they convey this sense of movement and this kind of, 3D approach was not in the, the, the stuff that Ralph, Ralph Senior Associates did. They just didn't have this design flair that Les did. And if we look at the evil weevils part and way between between evil and weevils, he's added in a caterpillar. And the, there's an, an unevenness to all the letters. So the two E's of weevils and the V it's very much crafted to create this idea of energy and motion and excitement. And the spraying, the way that there's a 3D effect for this, the white spray that's going over the characters, all of this creates this idea of motion. And then in front of, the, of Felix himself, you can see that a ball has landed and there's three movement lines coming down because the ball has come down from the, these tubes above. And what you've got is people are seeing this in an advert in a magazine and going, I have, Dad, I've got, I want you to order this through mm. mail order. Dad, let's go into WH Smith's on Saturday to buy this game. Mm. <laughs> you know, critical. And this is what really makes and drives sales, drives people into the shops 
to buy games. This is, oops, went the wrong way there. <laughs> Going down this way. This again, this game is Gauntlets, which again, I remember Stuart coming in and being so proud of the 3D <laughs> lettering he drew for those, that Gauntlet. Yeah. Yeah. And the Kirk, you see like almost like teeth marks in the bottom of the G and the yeah. top of the G. You know, he'd really thought that through. Now, this game, um, this was a friend of mine, Chris Terran. And Chris, I knew, he lived, I was in a, a, a um, um, what do you call it? A, a, a little flat, uh, digs in Leeds, um, paying £8 a week for the rental. And he was in the room below and lived quite a hermity life. Didn't really speak to anybody. I became friends with him. He built an atom from a kit, an acorn atom. And then the BBC came out and I started working for Micropower and I'd go and see Chris pretty much every night when I moved out to somewhere else. And he was creating adventure games. He'd never written anything that game related. But I had this idea and I talked it through with Alan Butcher that we should create an electron version of Planetoid, which was a Defender game. So I said to Alan Butcher, I've got this friend, Chris Terran. Why don't we go and see him? We'll drive over to see him and see if we convince him to produce his very first game. And he, as I say, he, he didn't even play arcade games. You know, <laughs> he just sat in his room pr programming adventure games written in fourth and, B and, and Atom Basic. So we got him a BBC Micro and an Electron. There was a way then I think you could link the BBC and the Electron to squirt the data across in some form or other. Or we had some kind of mocked up disc adapter for the Electron before it became official. So we could actually see what this looked because it had to be done with software scrolling. So this is what the game looks like on the left. And then I, I think I came up with the word in the name Gauntlets because I had a, a penguin thesaurus and thought, oh, that was a powerful name. And then I wrote the advertising words which appeared on there. And then we obviously got this game out. And Chris made some good money. I know that Dave told me the original version of Gauntlet was never available for the BBC, but there is now a version on the net that actually works with the BBC at the proper speed. So again, this airbrushed artwork to create this Im impact and the image made it quite clear. It was deliberate what that photograph is. Anybody looked at that said, oh my gosh, it's Defender for the Electron. Mm -hmm. And so therefore people knew what it was and then went off and bought it. So there you go. Now, one of the ones that I'm most proud of is this one, Mike. Mm -hmm. What yeah, do you that, that? yeah, I enjoyed uh, doing the visual for this. Yeah, this was yeah. where you had proper free reign, and mm. you know where you could really do it the way you really wanted to do it. Yeah, yeah. No, I I remember it well. Uh, definitely, the ones that I did the most work on, obviously, I I, I remember the best. And um, yeah, no, I do that one, Mister E. Yeah, <laughs> another copied game. Yeah, it was Mr. Do or Mr. Mr. Do. Yeah. yeah. And again, you can see the Mr. E writing was done on an A4 piece of card or a piece of paper stuck on card yeah. and separated. So Stuart, you would you and Stuart or you, Les and Stuart, would come into my, Micropower, you come into that big show we saw at the beginning, you come up the stairs to the yeah. first floor, you come into my office, and Stuart and, and you and Les would be so proud because we were very young. I mean, we how, how young. old would we you were... have been, Mike, when we did Well, this? I'd have been exactly the same age as you, Chris. So I was 20, 24. I was 24, and I'm about six months younger than you. Right, so you were 24, how old Stuart? Um, he was a year younger. So he was 23. Yeah. And Les was Les a year was... older than us. So mm -hmm. he'd have been 25. And Les was, sorry. Les is old, he's older than me and you by one year is Les. 
So I want to give an idea. What do you think? If you imagine you're what you like at 25, we, we need feedback. We haven't had girlfriends yet, necessarily. Yes. <laughs> and, we, you know, and so, and Stuart was very solitary. I don't know what Les Oh, was God, like. Stuart was a very shy, very shy guy. Very shy. So he needed a pat on the back. So he would come in as pleased as Prunch. And because I was enthusiastic and Mike was enthusiastic, there was this communal atmosphere. Like, was, oh my yeah. God, what have you done with this Mr. E? And yeah. look at the, the top of the exclamation mark of the yeah. of, of, of E in the red. You see, it tapers out to almost white, very 3D, exquisite yeah. done in those tiny little stars and moons and the Saturn planets in the bottom of the E, which is probably you, Mike, saying this is what I want because yeah. you're meticulous in your detail. So you yeah. have had to say, you know, in your visual, showing the visual what you wanted. I would have done, done yeah. Do. Yeah, definitely. I mean, my visuals were very detailed. You know, the, the, both Les, Les and Stuart have, have followed it more or less exactly. Yeah, I would say. But you can yeah. see, and it's this, the black at the top of the tunnel above the, the wizard and the creature, there's a blackness and the, the stark colours, this idea of a yeah. raging fire almost. It's, it's a real it's, shame that I don't have at least one visual left from that time because it'd be great to show people how close, you know, how detailed those visuals were, you know. Um, exactly, and then Stuart and, and Les would actually then draw those out and then Stuart would paint them mm. in yeah. using what is basically an aerosol can. So maybe we haven't really said airbrushing is it's it's like a small aerosol can and you'd attach to the back of the aerosol a series of colours. Yeah. yeah, it's like a, a, a pen with a little reservoir. And it, I mean, I think most people probably know what airbrush is. Custom cars are, are all airbrushed, you know, with um, faces and all sorts of graphics, you know, they're, they're much bigger, but they do use small airbrushes as well. And that's what we were using on, on these artworks. And then, of course, you have to do something called masking, where you yeah. actually lay down plastic, clear plastic, to clear cover plastic, it, yeah. but you didn't want the spray to hit. Yeah, and you had to do that lots of times because, you know, um, you can see there's lots of different colours, there's, there's lots of airbrush work. So... You know, that masking process is time consuming. The actual spraying itself, it doesn't take very long. It's the masking up that takes ages. Does this make sense to you, Colin? Because it's easy for Mike and I to understand it, but the average person understand what masking is. Um, I understand it from the Photoshop uh, and understanding of masking, Ooh. but yeah, not so <laughs> you much. You can imagine it's physical. done with paper and clear plastic and stuck down with a bit of tape. Yeah. And then it, they've masked down, so like the blue, the blue stripes that had to be. Laid we had um, clear um, plastic that was uh, a little bit tacky, not too tacky to pull colour off, mm. but tacky enough so that the the colour didn't bleed underneath. So um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> crikey, Photoshop would have died for that. I mean, so <laughs> how know. long? How many hours would? So you spent a few hours doing the initial yes. visual. Yeah. And then Les basically had to blow that up, you know, on a, on a, yeah. a, to a larger size. So you'd use a photographic equipment. To well, we'd use a great big camera, which was as, uh, you know, when I say big, it'd probably be about um, four or five foot tall by about three foot square. Um, and and you would wind it up. So you put your visual on the, the bottom part of the camera and then you'd be in a darkened room so that you could actually see through the glass at the top the bigger version. And you see that on a piece of tracing paper. So you'd enlarge it as big as you wanted to enlarge it on this tracing paper. And then you'd actually draw in pencil over the tracing paper. So literally, Les would be in a dark room. Yeah. It's leaning over a piece of glass and yes. then trace on top, just like how you almost limit similar to how Disney, the team at Disney yes. would actually use onion paper, the glass, the yeah. onion skin. And then he would then, obviously, um, that would be rubbed down onto a, a piece of artboard. But then he would put his 
he wouldn't draw it exactly the same as what I've done the visual. He would then put his little spin on it. So you know the facial features and 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 eyes and things would be different to all how I drawn them. But the whole but basically it was 90% of what I'd done. But then Les had put his own flair into it as well. And the same with Stuart when he worked on it. I had ideas, or me and you had ideas of, of how we see it look, but he would have a free reign of, you know, like that vignette that you see in, in the exclamation mark there. Mm. It's called a vignette, V-I-G-N-E-T-T-E. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that, we wouldn't have specified that. Stuart would have probably just just done that. Exactly. Yeah, so. And how, so how many hours would Les have spent doing the drawing first? Well, you know, that could have taken a day. A wow, day. that's a long time. Yes, yeah, yes. And, 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 and Stuart, probably the same. Yeah, so you're looking at half a day for your work, a day for Les and a day yeah. for Stuart. And then all the time for me going in and out of your office with the visuals. So <laughs> Driving half an hour from your yeah, office to my office. backwards and forwards, having meetings. You know, you've probably got four days in it somewhere around. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, and then, and then, then what you didn't see was all the time I spent at the repro houses. So I'd be going there to get the scans done. I'd be getting the films done. I, I kept going in to make sure they were doing it correctly. And then I'd get to a stage where I'd come back and see Chris, and then we'd do the chromelins. So you know, I mean, and that would that process would take best part of a week, definitely. Um, so, you exactly. know, this, I mean, Fantastic. and I remember in those days, just the scanner operator, so the, the, a repro house had um, one guy whose job was just to scan things and the scan, scan things on drums. And this piece of equipment would have cost typically 100, 200,000 pounds. And in those days, there were unions that controlled wages and, of course, they were really a scanner operator. It was really expensive to do a scan in those days. Not like today where it's nothing. And he would be paid a fortune. I always used to gripe like, you know, where the designers, where the ones that create everything. Yet the scanner operator was the most highly paid person in our industry. Indeed. And he's doing nothing as far as I was concerned. Yeah. <laughs> And the other thing to finally finish on this image is uh, we need to thank Dave. And um, my, my brain's just gone, Colin. So Dave's surname is... <laughs> Dave Moore. Sorry? Dave, Dave Moore. Moore. Of course it is. So Dave scanned this in from a package, a, a box, and yeah. then tidied it up in Photoshop. And this image was then provided by Dave to iDesign to go into the Acon in Pixels book, all beautifully tidied up, which is amazing. It now, is what amazing. Was very when when kind, I first saw it, I thought, I don't know where they've got that from. <laughs> there you go. Now, then we're going to show this, and this is an original illustration, a new illustration done by Les Ives just for the Acon in Pixels book. So you can see Felix in the factory. I haven't shown it, which is the Mr. Mine is yeah. there. There's a superior one, which I think is Elixir, and, so, and then Death Star, which I'll show you later. Yeah. So onwards, because I realise we're going, there's lots to say. This <laughs> is a magazine from, um, called Heavy Metal, which was only in America, but cost a blinking fortune to get it imported into the UK. But it showed all the latest trends in airbrushed artwork, because I'd say this was really blinking hard to do, and very expensive equipment required, but this was a, 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 a a cult magazine in the States. But what you'll see, there's this central artwork in the center is what a guy called Philippe Druyer in the center, a French guy. And he did a comic called Voz. So when I moved to Superior, we used a bit mm. of Philippe's style. I showed to Mike to create this because this was part of the stuff that I did for, we did for Richard because I left Micropower and went to work for Superior. Now, I think some of the slides, I think it didn't juggle in time before here, but this is what the final ad work looked like. 
And what I was very keen on, and, and I had more free reign with Superior, was to get multiple screenshots to show what you actually got in the game. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if we zoom in, we can see how people were looking at the number of sprites on the screen yeah. and the variety of the game. And of course, you can see Les Ives beautiful artwork that was in the center there. You can see the airbrushing, the blue on the around the, that's done by Stuart. But I'm going to show you the bottom of the screen where the guarantee box is. You see our guarantee and how we stole the idea for that game box. It's a bit pixelated, but you can see that this mm. is a guy called Philip Druyer that I actually stole the idea from because that's, that's how we put this together. So I was always looking at comics to nick the idea. The other thing that's probably worth pointing out is you'll see above the Superior Software Limited, we pay up to 20% royalties. And I found that typeface, it's called Dave, D-A-V-E. It's got a slightly pixelated view to it. It was a very new typeface from Letraset. Mm -hmm. And Mike had, I think he had to buy it, Mike, but I yeah. thought it was very modern. And I think you can see it there at the top, a spectacular arcade game. That's right, yeah. It gave it a very much, so I was, I literally went to bed each night and all I did was look through books of design and letter set catalogs. So whereas other people might be looking at more adult material, I was looking <laughs> at typefaces. And that was my, and literally salivating over which typeface we could use on a, yeah. on a game. And, and of course, we did make some up, but you know, we, we, as, as you can see throughout these, you know, typefaces were a little bit limited in them days. So say speech or whatever, we, we, we would make it up um, a piece of lettering bespoke. Exactly. Yeah. And here where I had all I did gave to my, from my memory was I, on a piece of white paper, I did a stick man, which was a circle and a couple of arms like crossing mm. and then a wiggly line to give an idea of smoke and, a, and the, the simplest idea of a box underneath, which was the computer. That was what I remember. And speech, I wanted like flash lines in some, so I knew I wanted some kind of um, movement to the lettering yeah. and angled. And then what Mike then did, you did Mike, was actually take my ridiculously simple <laughs> idea and create something which was, where I just thought was beautifully done. And I think this one is is really clever because it's not even a game. At the end of the day, this is a is a utility really. Um, but the the artwork for it almost kind of makes it even more than that. Like this isn't just a utility for the BBC Micro. Like there's something really exciting about this. Mm. Well, just give you an idea of what I did. It, what what happened was I just happened to be speaking to Dave Hoskins, um, who'd written the Ghouls game for Micropower. I'd moved to Superior. He talked to Micropower about producing, putting speech on the ROM. And I said, because I knew about a pro program in America for the Atari called SAM, Software Automatic Mouth, that was sold on cassette, even though you could buy cartridges for the Atari ROM chips. Mm. So I said, oh my gosh, we can launch SAM into the UK for the BBC. So all that David had was this routine, which was 49 phonemes that he managed to get together in 8K. And I said, David, David, don't sell it to Micropower. Let <laughs> us at Superior do it. I'm going to call it speech with an exclamation mark. And I said to Richard Hansen, we need the following routines. We need a simple like text input thing that people could do. We need a simple educational spelling game. Mm. And, and Richard sat at home and wrote some of these programs himself. David Hoskin, but to my spec, because I said, this is what we need. And then Mike did this visualization for it. And then the advert, of course, we deliberately going back and see that there's no text on the left and right, mm. because we needed all these words, because I like lots of words. And the words were written there. At last, speech synthesis at a price you can afford because this was 9 95 
And, and it, the paragraph there, simply typing, say, I am talking computer as easy as one, two, three, and the computer speaks. And on the right side, you can see there are five programs, speech, demo, spell, say, file, and locate. And, and as a result, we got some amazing sales from this. Mm. But I was nicking ideas from America. And you can see it's this marketing approach, this basic idea, which really David was just playing around with. He wasn't creating to sell. It was a bit of fun. Mm. I converted into something to sell. And then Mike and his team made it just so exciting, this idea of yeah. a genie out of a computer. And then it was converted to the Commodore 64, Amstrad CPC, um, um, Archimedes, and so on. And uh, I was very proud of this, you know, creating this. But I'm a marketing guy and a package, you know, and I loved working with Mike. And one of the first things we did was Citadel. Mm. And the idea that I had for Citadel, Mike and I talked about, was we needed a four by three matrix of images. Because if you look at those, every one of those 12 images looks very different. So you look at that and go, oh my gosh, there's <laughs> just so much going on. Yeah. And then the lettering at the top, so you've got an idea now, the airbrush lettering. And what we wanted was a very angular lettering. So we probably taught the two of us of the, the basic idea of how that would look, you know, with my crappy idea, I would have thought. And then Mike drew it up properly, you know, you know to try and understand that. Notice how we used Dave again. I'm very much for having an idea, you know, like a, a stylistic approach, the best arcade adventure ever, which is what it was. And again, the, the wording, a huge adventure featuring over a hundred deep, beautifully detailed screens. Now, one of the reasons I created this advert because I was so angry with what had happened with Castle Quest for the BBC, which I'll show you, which was I wanted to do this approach for a game called Castle Quest for the BBC. And Bob went with a company called Kids oh. who did a black package with no illustrations whatsoever. And I thought that was a really dumb way to promote a game. So when I, one of the reasons I left Micropowers because of that, came to work for Superior, brought Mike with me to Superior, which I hadn't said, convinced Richard, who had done some packaging, which I really didn't like, got Mike to do all the packaging so Mike and I could do it the way we wanted when I had even more free reign mm -hmm. than Bob gave me at Micropower. And then in the bottom, so we can see there, the detailed graphics, people could zoom, you know, really look in and go, wow. And what you'll see in the top right is this hooded character. And you see it again in the image, the second image down on the right hand side. And then the way that we use that and said, let's use that character. And that's how we mm. interpreted it here. And we were, I think, maybe more you than me, which is a more like the Ewok characters were they in Star Wars. That was the, e was the Ewoks? No, it wasn't Ewoks. Oh, whatever it was from Star Wars and New Hope to create that image there. And probably between the two of us, we came with this parchment idea to fit in with the castle idea mm -hmm. for the guarantee. And how that contrasts with the, the speech bubble from Vuz in mm -hmm. the previous one. It, we were much more between us having more fun, won't we, Mike, in terms of how yeah. do we make this much more graphically interesting? Yeah, I mean, it was great uh, with Superior because we did have completely free reign. I mean, Richard, he just left us alone. <laughs> well, he could see that this was our baby and we just yeah. absolutely adored, you know, visual, making these games look really pretty. That wasn't his skill. He was a brilliant business owner. He mm. was brilliant to actually connecting with the programmers. He was a brilliant programmer himself. Yeah, he was the a business, good programmer. The yeah. business ran well. And of course, then he went on and did all the incredible negotiation with the likes of Aconsoft to republish Elite and also turn the likes of Barbarian and so on into BBC versions mm. 
and, and really did very, very well. Now, I know that time is of, of limited, but this was another thing that I was ridiculously proud of. So I came up with this idea, can you write games? I, what I did was I drew the three images down the center as the very simplest. So if you imagine how my rubbish graphics, but I needed a, a guy with a speech bubble. So I drew that. I wanted Repton in the center. I, want, I had a stick man in front of a computer. And then the third image was the Repton 2 advert with the cassette. So imagine the, the, the most ridiculously simple black and white, you know, with a blue pen on a piece of paper I drew. And we talked with, through that with Mike. And this is what you created, Mike. Yeah. I remember it, yeah. Yeah, it, it looks good. It still looks good now, I think. But where the, I think is very beautiful is where you have that flair in the design. Not only were the images beautifully rendered and mm. stylized, but the way the speech bubble, the, the, the thought bubble overlaps with the red just below games. Now, yeah. it, you might not know, but that kind of thing, it, it adds an extra energy. It's it pushing does. through. It's pushing through boundaries. And it I think it's, we repeated the, the red and white lettering in the little indents. So the T, the O, the A, the I. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I know, remember that I wanted a, what is it called? A drop, what are they call hack What's it called? Drop caps. That's it. I knew I wanted drop caps, but what you did was make them red red squares with the lettering inside yeah. which really made and this really brought in and it made it clear that, that tim tyler had earned thirty thousand pounds from this game which works out a, a six figure sum so a hundred thousand pounds if anybody's in overseas it's us dollars a hundred and thirty thousand dollars that he brought in and equally again death star offer Peter Johns, we saw Death Star before, again, a six-figure income just from writing a game in the evenings that he did. And what I would created was I created this um, top six. I'm not sure how much I wrote and how much, but I think maybe it was 50-50. I don't know. But I wrote some of the top tips for game authors and then Richard wrote the other. So I couldn't remember whether Richard wrote it first and I added lots of examples from what I knew. But I think I maybe gave him the idea what I wanted as the tips. He did his version and I did mine. But I was tremendously proud of this. And the other thing I'm proud of, if you look on the right-hand side, the bottom, the SS logo, which has a 3D approach mm. to it. So this is how we took what was a very much, a very unattractive SS logo, yeah. you and yeah. I, Mike, to create this 3D approach and which then with this red line with the 3D imagery. So it, we were not taking away and not moving too far from what Richard had come up with, but making it far more professional. Yeah. yeah. And then inside, there's like another illustration. So we're using this particular font, which I, I remember we were probably choosing the fonts for this, you know, the very small I, the dot above the I of submitting you know, a very stylized typeface. Yeah. And then again, these new illustrations, but these illustrations were two color inside because it's very expensive to produce full color for this. And we got loads more games as a result of this. So this was you and me having a lot of fun, Mike. Yeah, yeah, it would be. <laughs> yeah. And then Dave produced this. Um, so some of the graphics now only we can see mostly the work that you did was in the bottom two, which was yeah. Felix the Evil Wheels and Mr. E. And then, you know, yes, so these were just other adverts that I'd been involved with, um, mostly before you came along. Um, but then what I've talked about is Repton, which oh, was, which was the, I think that came, but this again was, um, again, the idea between the two of us was, I wanted six images down the side with a with a caption underneath each image. So the, the, the bit in the center was to show representative. We needed to, we didn't need, want something too stylized like Mr. E. We wanted it to be very clear what this game was and people That's knew right. about yeah. Alder Dash. Go on. Well, by this time, the screenshots were so much nicer anyway. Yes. So it made sense to actually show them because we had nothing to hide. Um, 
And people marveled at, at the quality of the screenshots. Exactly. That. Yeah. And, and anybody who'd got a friend, because lots of people, they had the BBC because they had it in school, or there was the Electron because it was the price thing. But again, it was because it was the BBC micro because the parents were buying for the kids to program. But really, what their friends had was a Commodore 64, which was really a games machine. So they knew about Boulder Dash. And this, uh, the programmer here, Tim Tyler, had never actually played Boulder Dash. He'd only seen what they look like in the reviews and then came up with an inter like a variation on that, which became Repton. And I think you said uh, in the chat we were having yesterday, Chris, that you, know, you were pretty instrumental in the Repton actually coming out in the first place. Like you believed in the game, right? I re yeah, I really, I really believed in Repton. I felt it was gonna be spectacular. And we put a lot of energy into mm. the marketing of this making sure the Electron version was out at the same time. We added a password feature because I'd, I'd come across password features in the, in America, what was going on there. Equally, there were a few games in the UK because I was following the Sinclair market and so on. And so we added that thing in as well. And equally, I wanted a competition in there. And there was a display screen with a congratulatory message. So there was stuff like that and there was a closing date. So all that was stuff that I was very involved with as mm. well. And then we went on to do Repton 2 with the very much Chrome looking 2. And notice again at the bottom on the right hand side where we use the same um, Vuz type Death Star speech bubble copying Philip Drouillet, the French comic designer mm. on the side. And I think the other thing we did, can you see there the third, on the left-hand side, the screenshot, third down, we did a close-up of a monster. So I, that was again, you and me, Mike, saying, well, what can we do this? And you say, yeah. yes, let's do that. Because you were a big game player yourself. I was, yeah. And, and I could see you know, the merit in, in what, what we were doing. I mean, you know, I was buying these things so <laughs> playing them and yeah. then you can see at the bottom we have this competition where the first hundred winning entrants will each receive a beautifully designed i've completed wrecked on two cotton t-shirt all correct entries received before the 31st of march 96 will be eligible for the prac hash prize of 200 pound all that to i create this because it's not just that it's people thinking by god this is a sensation this game Hmm. So Repton did well. There was this idea of Repton 2. And then I'd seen level designers in the States. Nobody really in the UK was doing any level designers. And I wasn't sure whether I couldn't quite convince Richard for Repton 2. And also it was like, speed, let's get this out. But I said, for Repton 3, we really need a level designer. And so Richard, in either between the two of us, we actually lay out what that was going to look like the screen editor and 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 uncle well, I showed him sorry, some of the editor screens from in a magazine called Compute, which was a an American magazine that I paid a fortune for to import into the UK, and that became Repton Three. And I know Matthew Atkinson as is actually on this call right now, um, and it was Matthew that created this incredible game with this screen editor and the fact that you could edit the characters as well. So all this I was pushing for very strongly. And Richard was just so willing to follow along with that. And, you know, and the way I actually put in, I can see in the set second paragraph of the text that I also added in a quote from Acon users, technical editor, Bruce Smith. And Bruce Smith was very famous. He'd written a number of books for the BBC Micro. He was the ed technical editor for Acon News. And he wrote, Repton 2 is better than anything I played on the BBC Micro and Electron. Brilliant. So this idea of having a series of games, you know, was just, you know, just made a big difference. And if we zoom in, we can see, again, not only was it, it was important to show, you know, some kind of graphical representation, but we needed to really show that there was a screen editor and what it looked like and the character editor and all these words, and the way that Mike and I put them together 
meticulously to say how do we, which is the most important, the graphical representation of the screen images, because people were spending a lot of money and they, it's like, oh my gosh, I've got to save up for this game. So as you mentioned, Chris, we've got, um, we've got Matthew on the call. Um, Matthew, I'd just be really curious to hear what you thought of the artwork for your game. Yes, I thought it was uh, very well laid out. Um, uh, like you said, the, the screenshots were excellent and it, it just showed all the different parts of the game and the editor so you know exactly what you were uh, buying. When I designed the screen editor, I, I decided to try and make it as much like the Apple. I'd seen the Apple on TV and the Apple Mac, I think it was, or the Lisa at the time, and I was quite taken with uh, the AMX mouse. And I wanted to incorporate as many of those features, you know, the drop-down menus, those, those sorts, sorts of things, uh, clicking on icons, as I could into the editor to make it as um, up-to-date as possible. And how long did it take you to write the game? Well, I think we started, I think we we initially went out for lunch, if you remember, in about February 86. We came over to Leeds and it was myself, um, you and Richard, we went out to lunch and we discussed the project. Uh, and then uh, they went, went back to uh, the offices uh, to discuss it further. And you showed me Repton and Repton 2. Uh, and I think it was round about, oh, September, October, that we actually completed everything. That would be, uh, you know, the BBC Micro versions, the disc versions, the master version, the Acon Electron versions. Uh, and it was released, was it November the 5th, if I remember rightly, 86? So I would have left by then because I... Yes, I, I mean, I, may, I only met you the once. Uh, Richard said that you had made a job offer and you would have been a fool to refuse it. So he said, you know, he gave you... you his blessing to go to whatever that job was at the time. And I think at that time, that's when Steve Botterill came along. He did, yeah. And took over from himself. And that's had dealings with Stephen, you know, from then onwards. I think he must have left around about, oh, would it be June, something like that, 86? I thought it was August. Yes, August, somewhere around there anyway, towards the end of the project. Fantastic. Because I went to York for Fiora Press, which is the publisher of, of uh, the micro user, and the Electron user, and then set up, I managed all the Mini Office 2, Mini Office Professional, um, and then set up Mandarin software with, and so on, I'll show some of those in a little bit. So this is what I left at Micropower, which I was so unhappy about, because this is how they marketed Doctor Who in the Minds of Terror with this, are you ready for brain-to-brain -brain experience, which I thought was the wrong way to market, where there was no screens you couldn't actually see what you were getting and it was hard to read because you had to twist the page all the way around to actually read it and you know the it's just like it's just very difficult and and it's not the way that people buy so i'd left by then because i completely disagreed with this approach and of course i don't know how well it sold but anyway so you went on mike to produce imogen mm, yeah and again, so I'd left by then, but beautiful, uh, beautiful imagery there. And then you did the design for Micropower Magic. Oh, yes, yeah. And at the same time, I set up Mandarin software for Europress. Yep. Yes, so I ran, I was the manager director for Mandarin software. And you and Les yep. and Stuart did this illustration for Time and Magic, which was a repackaging mm. of what Level 9 had done. So we, we we bought the license for it and we created this. Yeah? Yep. Yeah, I remember it well. Right? Yeah. A bit pixelated, yeah. but I loved it. It was beautiful. It was nice. Yeah, it did look good. Yeah. And you'll see it better on here where I've added, yeah. where the advert is because we had to allow room for the text and show off what the, the images, because we actually, we sorted out all these um, graphics because it was the very early days of adding graphical images into text adventures. So I, I set up, came up with the idea of Mandarin, again, using a thesaurus as I had done with got the title Gauntlet. We've got that beautiful um, stone looking writing for time and magic. Mm. Yeah which again, you did beautifully. Yeah, and then, good, I enjoyed this one as well, yeah. 
And that was based, so the chalice we actually got manufactured. So I commissioned a jeweler to actually create this chalice. And it could be that you drew the chalice, Mike, or whether, in other words, how you wanted those uh, amethysts on or whatever they are, yeah. or whether the jeweler did that and then you actually took photographs or we lent you the chalice to actually... You know, I, I can't uh, remember, but, but the only thing I can remember clearly with this one was I drew the lettering. Oh, you um, actually drew that Lancelot yourself? I actually drew that, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I'll come up with the whole design, but I actually worked on the lettering myself. And um, of course, Stuart has done the rest of the the, the thing. Um, but yeah, um, I, I, I enjoyed that. I, I used to enjoy creating letter styles that reflected what it was we were we were selling, you know. Exactly. And, and yeah. so people don't get as well is that this is the Holy Grail, and this appeared before King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. It floated in front of them, which is why you've got this ghost, you know, we had this idea of the ghost image, but equally there's this <laughs> above, which links in with Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom mm -hmm. kind of approach, which was this, <laughs> you know, and there's probably other things around that time that reflects, so you can see the cultural reference points that come in. And then you can see more clearly on the advert which I wrote and the way that the, the travel is travel back with the uh, drop, drop caps, because I like drop caps because we, Mike and I had done this for Can You Write Games uh, before. And then this idea of win this solid silver grail with 5,000 pounds, an exciting quest for the Holy Grail competition, full details in every box. So that was done. And then the other thing we did uh, that oh, yeah. Mike did a little bit of work, which was you had an opportunity. You were given this transparency, Mike, for this yes. Lombard Irish Rally car. And what Stuart did, is that right, Mike, is you added no faster stripes. Yeah, the he went the over the, we, we um, basically took the image and worked it up with a bit more airbrush work to make it better than it was. Yeah. So there's the airbrushing on the front of the windscreen. There's yeah. air, a wiggly, a wiggly look on the side windows. Yeah. And then people can see the whoosh signs. Yeah. Yeah. Behind the behind the car, to the left of Pirelli, and also just below where it says per, Pirelli, there's a little whoosh there from the the curve of the what you call mudguard, as it were. Mm. And I think that some of the groundwork as well was roughed up as well. I think it was, yeah. 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 But I couldn't get, they wouldn't let you because I was away at the time in, in the States on, on the business trip. And when I came back, you, you were just incensed, Mike, because Derek Meekin, the chairman, was so rude. You know, and yeah, I've never come across it. that. You know, um, I'd always worked with people like yourself that were very respectful. We got on well, etc. And I never come across somebody that I was working for that was um, that was you know uh, like that. So it was a, quite a shock. But that's how innocent we were in them days. You know, of course. But what happened was they didn't respect your skill in involvement. Yeah. So the Lombard RAC Larry Logro there, you would have done a far better job. You see, it's very flat. So I couldn't convince the team to do that properly. And that was just the official logo. But I'm sure with a bit of arm twisting, we could have made that far more attractive. Oh, we could have done, yeah. yeah. So it was yeah. a letdown. So it wasn't the way I wanted. And this was the ad that I created with the four images and the captions. See, I'm obsessed with imagery, multiple images, and I was obsessed with captions, and the more words, the better, and in italics, and lots of words down the side to give an idea of what they were getting. We had a booklet inside and so on. Um, I know we're coming to the end because I know we've gone over our time, what we're going to do. That's all right, Chris, no problem. This was um, one of the reasons I left Micropower. This was how... Castle Quest was packaged. Um, it was just black. It says Castle Quest by Micropower, probably the most challenging game ever devised for the BBC Micro. Now, I think that's bloody ridiculous because <laughs> you don't, it's something called show, don't tell. You don't tell people that it's 
the most challenging game. And anyway, why would that be exciting? You know, because it's not about being challenging. It's about being fun. You show them that with imagery and powerful words. And they didn't do it in the back, did not show what the game looked like. There was this idea of mystery, which I rich, really, really strongly disagree with. But, but Bob was convinced by kids that this was the right approach. And this was the advert that we launched with, bet you one pound you can't crack it, which I really didn't like. And um, it was very expensive to produce this Castle Quest image of the, on the cassette, which was mocked up, lifted up and floated on this um, matrix background. And then this idea of the MP4 scroller armor, but there were no images. And then they'd linked him with all these shops where you could get this game that was going to be, there was various presentation shops. But I thought this was a mistake. You needed to show the game in action with a lot of energy. And the back cover should have had six screenshots and some exciting words and the game would have sold a lot better. Mm, yeah. So And so when I left, I saw this and I was so upset. And that's when we did Citadel and the way we did Citadel. And I'm sure probably Citadel did even better even though Castle Quest was a, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant game. And this is what it looks like in um, Akon in Pixel's book. Um, so a beautiful game. It was Anthony Southcott that did it, Southcott. And I remember, you, I showed you the, um, at the beginning of this presentation, I showed you the showroom. And I remember being in the showroom with Anthony Southcott and Alan Butcher showing, seeing this game being shown off. I remember David Braven coming in and showing Zarch in the early days in the Archimedes before it was eventually published by Superior. And I remember Adrian Stevens coming into that showroom and showing off Mr. E, because I think we called it Mr. Do. It wasn't actually called Mr. E, it was eventually changed to Mr. E for before we actually released it, but a lot of fun. And at that point, I will say at the end and go from, <laughs> say, back to you, Colin. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot uh, to both uh, to both you and Mike for that. That was really, really good. And it's not just me saying that. So before I before I go into the, the questions that we've had, um, there's just been so many lovely, positive comments that people have been sending me while, you, while you've both been talking um, about how distinctive the artwork is, how how like it's bring, brought back so many uh, childhood memories, just seeing you know a lot of this artwork and, and hearing you sort of talk about it. Um, the fact that you know there are there are some games here that people didn't realize were like your idea, Chris, like the Cybertron mission, um, you know your idea to, to to make that for the BBC and and how much people um, appreciated that game, and obviously the the Repton level editor and, and Repton in general. Um, and I think you'll be uh, probably quite pleased with this comment, Chris, that uh, actually another Chris in, in the group said, I think the cover is why I never bought Castle Quest. So, Oh, my God, <laughs> if, if I that's... love that. That is so sweet. <laughs> if that's not vindication for you, I don't know what is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, I, I'm, I still have this now. I'm a consultant now. And, you know, it's it's hard to take, you know, to know <laughs> whose advice to follow. But I, you know, and, it, and I was so frustrated, but the problem with advertising agencies, like we use this company, Kids, they launched a, a beer, if you've heard of Cronenberg 1664, mm -hmm. and it was originally marketed as a, a slightly non-conformist lager. And that was done by Kids in Yorkshire. And they charged Micropart a fortune to create all that stuff for um, the BB Doctor Who game and Castle Quest but they, they didn't understand games. And the thing was that Mike and I, Mike had all these computer games that he was playing with his Spectrum. So we understood the market. We, got, we were buying games ourselves and we were pouring over the magazines and all I did every night and during the day was pour over magazines and see where the trends were in wow. packaging and in and what was in games with passwords and so on. Oh, that's great. Um, I'm going to turn to the questions now, so I'll, I'll um, kind of tip them either to Mike or Chris or, or both of you, depending on who, you know, whether, uh, whether either of you have been asked specifically. So um, the first one from, a, from another Mike, Mike Rose, um, and it's to you, uh, Mike, Mike Ellis. Um, 
if you'd done the work that you did back then, but using the modern tools of today, do you think that it would have looked the same? Or do you think that there was something about that methodology back then that, that kind of gave the artwork that quality? Well, it's difficult to say because if we got the tools that we've got now, then we wouldn't be producing games covers anywhere like it because I, I, I see what you're saying. So if we'd got Photoshop, say, Mm. Um, okay, uh, and, and let's say that the graphics of the game are still as poor, if you like, as they were in the day. But I got this modern way of producing the artwork. We would still have, have had to create an image. We would still have had to create an illustration because there was nothing else to replace those graphics. Uh, so we would have we would have probably ended up... I mean, Photoshop is not an artist. It's a tool. Yeah. So so Photoshop would have made things like airbrushing easier, et cetera, maybe speed of the process up. But the initial design, I would have still had to... I would still sketch it now. You know, I would I would still do a visual. Um, what what computers can do now is, is aid an artist or a designer. They can't come up with designs... Or if they do, you know, they're not going to be on point, are they? You know, they're just not. So um, it's all about understanding the um, the brief and being able to interpret it. Try to put yourself in the mind of the person that's going to play this or buy it. And to do that, you've got to come up with something fairly original. And uh, yet, I mean, I mean, I know new computers now have got this artificial intelligence and that, but I think we're a way off them being able to create a piece of artwork that represents a game. Um, yeah. But yes, I mean, to answer your question is, if I'd have had Photoshop and things like that, it would have speeded the process up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, a question to both of you, really. How much contact did you typically have with the programmers who made the games? So, like, when you were coming up with the, the idea of, you know, what the artwork should look like, did you interact with the programmers much? No. N no. So, um, you, did you ever meet any programmers, Mike? No. No, never. No, and I'm the same. It wasn't, it wasn't part of it. So, um, like, I mean, the only reason I met um, like Adrian Stevens was literally he'd bring up the latest version of Mr. Do, but it, how it was packaged, that was purely my job. And equally, all the words that I wrote, um, I would write them myself and wouldn't even necessarily even show because they weren't interested. And also, you know, they were at school during the day, you know, <laughs> some of them were. Yeah. I was working nine to five, five days a week. So it's not like we can, you know, like in lockdown where we're working seven days a week. Um, and they weren't interested and we only had phone. We couldn't, we couldn't email anybody, hmm. you know, and we, what would we do? And we'd post, you know, we could put something in the post the next day, but yeah, we were much, I, he, Mike and I were working in isolation. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Um, uh, uh, this is probably more to you, Chris, given your sort of views around wh what the, um, what the, advertising materials and the cover art should look like. Um, you're probably familiar with what Acorn soft covers looked like, which was essentially a title and a screenshot. So what, what, what were your thoughts on the way that they marketed their games in that way without actually having the artwork in, as part of the... Well, it, it worked brilliantly um, in the early days because what they had was, it was official, which made a big difference. Mm. It was very stylized. It was very nicely done. I mean, the, the imagery was thrown right up for like, and of course it was called Defender when it was first launched. And then they got their bottoms spanked by um, Atari and then had to change it to Planetoid. Um, but those early games, I think even Aviator was just, you could actually see the wireframe image. And then it only really changed to a graphical image. Well, you know, around the time of Elite, you know, because that was a long process and they realized they had something spectacular on their hands. But it, it was very much through the retail. So there was this, all the Acon soft stuff was together in a, in a particular area, as it were. But then we had to differentiate ourselves. And the way we did that was through, you know, this imagery. And of course, you know, the, the team at Acon soft were programmers. And so they were a bit more 
digital in their approach. Whereas we, we were comic buyers, you know, mm. and we, we bought all the magazines and we knew all the range of magazines. Whereas the BBC team were very much, they came off of, out from the Acorn Atom and they were programmers. They weren't games players. It was a BBC micro that you were really going to learn to program on. So we had a different take on how to market games. And also we were, what got our stuff in the store was the fact that we were, the games were advertised on the back of magazines. So that created a pull into shops and the shops knew that we would be pushing these games strongly and so bought in lots of stock. Hmm. Okay. Um, and in terms of putting together the uh, some of the materials, obviously some certainly some of the later uh, material that you showed us in, in the slides, you could see the screenshots from the games. Um, so a question from Stuart, he said, he says he loves CRT displays, um, but they're quite difficult to photograph because of the sort of feedback that you get from the machine. So was it a challenge back then to, to get the screenshots? Mike? Um, yeah, I think it, I think it was. Um, I mean, the early screenshots we were taking, we were having to just photograph a screen. So we would have probably um, messed around with the lighting hmm. and then um yeah because we you know we couldn't get rid of things like you can do in photoshop nowadays so we would have had to take some time taking those screenshots um from what i remember we'd go to a photographic studio yes yeah and it would be completely black so all the windows yeah. would be closed over. that's right yeah yeah. And uh, the camera would be on a rost on, on a tripod, and it would mm. Mac and do all kinds of stuff. And that was, you know, take hours to do. Oh god, Maybe yeah. You were there, Mike, to sort of make sure that you were happy. I don't know. Mm. Um, but we would have lots and lots of transparencies. Transparencies then, is is what we came up with. Yeah, yeah. We didn't use a photograph. But it was a transparency. Yeah, yeah. And then okay. we would actually mark up. So Richard and I, more than anything, would actually mm. say this is. But equally we'd be passing some of the transparencies to Mike to pass yeah. on to Les, maybe even for Les and Stuart to look at so they knew what the game would look yeah, like. Yeah, we, we would look at those, but then to put them in the advert, we'd have to have them individually scanned and then they'd have to be worked into the films and, you know, as part of that repro process, basically. Hmm. But by then, we'd, we'd know exactly where they were going to go because I'd have done the visual me and Chris yeah. had discussed where they're going to go. So we had a plan, a blueprint of what we were going to do right from the beginning, really. And the other thing is to bear in mind is you, we couldn't do it with our own. There was no digital cameras then. Even mm. a, a good camera, yeah. was to, as the cheapest camera that I bought, I think it was 200 quid. Mm. And it was pretty much a snap camera. Yeah. We could never have done it. So the only way you could get something like that done was to use a professional photographer yeah. with his own studio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything was a was a labour. <laughs> everything was expensive, time consuming. How we produce so much stuff, I'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> a quick question to you, Mike. Actually, also from Stuart. Do, do you know if people may still practice real airbrushing, so not digital airbrushing today? Um, and if not, do you or do you ever miss any of the aspects of like real airbrushing? Yeah, I mean. But I, I, I could use an airbrush as well. Um, I, I did little bits. I mean, it's some of those things. I was looking at them thinking, I probably airbrushed part of that because I had an airbrush as well. Stuart was the airbrush artist, but if we were busy, I'd jump in and do some as well. So we were kind of multi-skilled with these things. Uh, but now um, I'm not sure where I would use an airbrush Maybe if I was making a model aircraft or something, a 3D thing, I might use one. But um, anything 2D is going to get into a computer. It's going to get into Photoshop, and you're going to use the airbrush in there, yeah. you know, um, which, again, you're going to have to use the same sorts of skills. You're still going to have to know where to put the shade in and, 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 and how to make it look how you want it. You're still going to have to have the same artist skills even using a modern computer. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll probably use the computer if it's just touching the photo, yeah. And um, a, quest a question from uh, Chris in the, in the group. Uh, so with Citadel and some of, some of the other games as well, um, the artwork that you created would then actually be put into the game to form the game loading screen. Um, so how, how did that come about 
and what did you think of the results when you know, yeah so that? that that was um well certainly we'd probably take um, a pro a photograph of the artwork that might produce it get passed across to the programmer from memory um i came up with this idea that this this citadel 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 kind of thing which came from because we knew we were launching speech and it was a way of getting people into that and we knew it would only be xk and we'd been speaking to david and probably he'd fiddled around with various things so we'd done that and then i think i think speech went into um the speech went into repton too i think as well with there's some um of David Hoskins speech program but the loading screen where we could actually put the graphical artwork was much easier later because it was when the program was on disc because we had so much space on the disc to actually have some artwork and so it was very much easier to do and we just made it more interesting and made the, the game more interesting as well so it was the early days of let's have a loading screen which partly was because the game took so long to load, so you'd have some kind of visual representation of the packaging. Um, but it was all part of before the game got mastered, we'd, we'd actually be able to show what the packaging looked like. So before it finally just said, oh, let's do a loading screen that sort of matches. And equally, the often the loading screen was put together not by the programmer, but by one of the general staff in and the technical. So in MicroPower, it'd be, one of the general guys would put something together who was doing the different masters separately from the program and probably equally, you know, the kind of thing that Richard on and his people involved with would actually say, oh, I can put together a quick loading screen based on what I know of the packaging. That's, uh, that's, that's really cool. Um, and uh, Mike, I think you mentioned um, when you were going through that um, you don't have any of the original artwork or not much of it left. Unfortunately, did you ever, no, no. Did you did you give any of it away to people? And do you do you remember um, who, you, who you might have given it to? Do you know what? I mean, I think if I gave some away, I'd probably give it to Chris, but um, I can't. Mike, you remember you did the Repton artwork. Did you give that to me or did you give it to Richard? So in other words, it's enormous. Yes. And you yeah. framed it. But I didn't know what who you gave it to. Well, I'll, I'll give it to you or Richard. <laughs> yeah, so Richard so, may still have it. I don't it know. May, it may, it may well still have it. Yeah, I mean, But it I, looked bloody fabulous because yeah. it... Because it's hard to see from the um, from the advert, but what you have is you imagine a big frame. Imagine the frame yeah. was like this. Then it was sat in the middle, so it airbrushed out to nothing. So yeah. in a picture, it looked absolutely fabulous, framed. But there's no yeah. titling of anything. It was just the illustration. So that looked off. But one thing that Mike did as a gift for me was you, we showed you the the um, brochure yeah. with the. Um, the mountain and the different characters on right at the beginning. Well, that was at three pages. We showed you the two page version. Mm. So it was two pages and two pages, but there was a three page version called the six page gate. So the, it was an absolutely enormous framing and mm. it was a three and a three behind a piece of card and it was all laid out. And I had that on my wall for years and I was so proud of it because it was such a staggering amount of work. It was. To put it together. And yeah. Mike did such the most stunning job and I was just so proud of, of what Mike and Les and uh, Stuart had created and what I'd been involved with. It was like, you know, like a scar, you know, yeah. that I have. Yeah. Like well, I just felt that we should frame it because it, it did look that good. I thought it looked, you know, you, you couldn't fail to go into Smith's and pick one of those and think, wow, you know, <laughs> I, want, I, want, I want most of these games. You know? <laughs> um, I've actually just got just got one more question, uh, Chris. In terms of the competitions, we saw references to them quite quite regularly on some of the superior um, adverts. Was that Was that one of your ideas to have competitions feature as part of the marketing? Well, I believe so. I mean, you know, it is going back 35 years, but I was very into competitions uh, because I'd seen bits of it. And also I, I bought pretty much every magazine and I could see what other people were doing. And as I say, I got compute from the States 
And I could see that there was this always this sense of let's have some kind of come. The other thing that come out was again, was it Masquerade, which was a Kit Williams wrote a book with a it was a hair that was made of silver with jewels encrusted. And that came out at the brand, the end of the 70s. So I was very much aware of that. And so this idea of a competition. So, and I knew that the, the cash prize was next to nothing, but it had to work. So anything like that. And I went on in future when I'm going on to Mandarin software and Europress with a lot of stuff with competitions to get people to buy the thing by a particular date. Okay. No, that, that makes that makes sense. Sorry, I do actually have one more question. I've just seen it came through while while we were talking. So, did did uh, did either of you, Mike or Chris, did you work on any of the Acorn Atom covers at all? No, it it was before the Atom was the it was the very end. I got involved at the BBC time, mm. so the, it was way way before. Yes, yeah. so at Mike did nothing. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've I've come to the uh, come to the end of the the questions that we've had submitted. Um, so I what, only, like... what I'd yep, love to on, say is, if anyone wants to get hold of me, I'm at christopherjohnpain.com, and you'll see stuff about my MicroPower and Superior software and um, Mandarin software stuff. You're oppressed. Equally, my email address is hello chrispain at gmail.com. So you're very welcome to reach out to me and say hi. Thank you very much. I was just going to say on behalf of everybody, first of all, I wanted to say a big thank you to, to both of you for uh, this really, really great talk. Um, you've been very generous with your time and uh, answering the questions as well. It's been really, really good, uh, really good fun. And to everybody else uh, who's on who's on the call now, uh, what we'd like to do is obviously show our appreciation if we can. And Stuart, you've got something there that none of us have seen, so it'd be lovely to get in contact. Oh my God, that's fantastic. I'm wondering what Chris has made of tonight's presentation. Uh, well, certainly enjoyable. Um, it's a world, really, that was a long way from mine. And um, uh, I'm bound to say to Chris, and uh, um, sorry, it was Mike, wasn't it, that um, you know everything you did was much appreciated. Um, by everybody working in Acorn Engineering and R and D, um, we we knew there was a, a big world beyond Acorn Soft, and um, I think we were all sort of very very proud when we saw so many um, uh, creative games and and uh, so much going on when we when whenever we got a chance to go out into the into the wider world away from Cambridge. So. Um, um, you know, it was, it was re really good to see folks like yourselves and, and everything that you did. And, and um, you, you know, I, I, I think I'd say here's to mutual success. Well, I remember these very well. Um, I'm not sure I remember numbers six, seven and eight, mind. Um, but um, uh, I mean, at the very beginning, these were th th this is all there was. And uh, <laughs> so when you when you bought an atom home um, uh, uh, for uh, friends or children to uh, have a go with, um, uh, they said, well, what can it do? So you'd get one of these out and listen to the cassette recorder beeping for a long while and um, hopefully be able to play Asteroids or something similar. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, um, I remember these packages being quite basic as well. There was a um, a polystyrene cutout inside, um, a, a rectangular block with a cutout for the cassette, and a second cutout, I think, possibly for a, a little booklet or some such. And then, then basically, the, the the outer skin was just fold over cardboard that was glued to the back of the polystyrene. I, I've, I've got one in my hand. You, can, you yeah. can't see it, but I'm uh, shaking the Acorn Soft Adventures pack and it's exactly as it described yeah, polystyrene yeah. with a cutout but anyway little quiz question atom games pack one the first game on this three pack compilation is asteroids who wrote that who wrote asteroids on atom games pack one the right answer is usually jonathan jonathan griffiths no he can't remember anything he's got a vague memory of writing a breakout game okay for, for the Atom, it was actually, because surely somebody must know, it's a very significant person in Acorn history. 
Well, was it DJD himself? No, he wrote Mastermind. Sophie? No. Steve Did Ferber he? wrote Asteroids mm. on Games Pack 1. One of the biggest challenges in the earlier days, and, and Chris might remember this as well, was finding reliable companies who could duplicate the cassettes. Um, <clears throat> there were very few companies who were even interested in doing it because it was compared to audio cassettes, it was, a, it was very much a niche market. Um, I seem to re recall there was one company in Wales somewhere we found that did it a reasonable job, but there were quite a few people who sort of set themselves up to do it and did it very, very poorly. Um, th there was a sort of mass duplication machine which worked at high speed and didn't require you just to get lots of cassette recorders and wire them up in parallel. But yeah, certainly quality assurance on, on early audio cassettes was, um, was something that troubled us a lot. And, and, and that's one of the few things I think that came across the wall into Acorn Engineering from Acorn Soft. Um, can, you, can you look at some of the signals we're seeing from these cassettes and help us to work out how to manage the engineering in, in the duplication process a little, a little better so we so we get uh, cassettes that work for more people more often. So just uh, just by way of introduction, so um, this is a little sort of bonus extra for the for the session, which we thought would be a nice way to close out the, the talk on all things artwork. Um, so as we've been saying throughout the talk, the artwork and style of packaging for cover art for m both Micropower and Superior is pretty iconic and it, it has a special kind of resonance. Um, and it didn't just inspire gamers back in the day to, to buy the games. Uh, it's also something which is, people like Mike and Chris effectively established a house style, if you like, that's been taken on by designers today uh, to honor new games, which are still being published um, by, uh, by Retro Software. So we're gonna take a look at some of the examples here and I'm hoping that Chris and Mike in particular will, will share their views on, on what they think of some of these designs, which effectively pay homage in a lot of cases to the artwork that, that they originally worked on. Um, so here we go. This is, uh, as it says, the Retro Software homebrew community from 2008 onwards. Um, so we've got some uh, a couple of games here, both uh, Zap and the, the Crystal Connection. So these ones were um, artwork by Dave Jeffrey. Um, and uh, I think it says that Dave says he's not a fan of his work on his first ever design using Inkscape. But uh, yeah, I think I think Dave Moore likes it. I like it. Um, yeah. What, what are your thoughts, gents? Yeah, well, it's got some good colour. Um... You know, it's it's fairly punchy. Hmm. Uh, I see you've not gone for any screenshots, Chris. Obviously, <laughs> it's definitely got the kind of superior, sort of early superior looks to it. I think. Um, yeah, it, fo it follows the some of the superior style, which of course is delightful for people who are entering into the retro area because it's like mm. it echoes back to what. Yeah. Richard originally designed back at the uh, beginning of 1980, the early 80s. Yeah. Mm. There we go. So, oh, there, yeah, we've got some uh, on the advert there. Yeah. Screenshots, yeah. Yeah, and of course the Bauhaus, it's called the Bauhaus, the font that's used, the typeface used. Mm. So, yes, it echoes that, which of course is just very familiar, which is always useful to reference back to stuff that people are familiar with. So it looks super. Mm. Oh, sorry. There's a, there's oh, a yeah, there. I got, there you go. So <laughs> that's the original yeah. style, which I, you know, yeah, so that's great. Of course, I wanted to move away from that because, of course, so many other companies were doing it. But of course, again, what you're trying to do there, you've got two titles being promoted, whereas what the big thing that we were doing with Death Star and Repton was actually probably promoting one thing. Mm. I see Mm. Uh, so this is uh, an original cover drawn by uh, by the author Paris Siddhartha in 1988 uh, for for Repton Repton Four, um, and I think that 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 was the uh, the inspiration or the sort of starting point for the for the Lost Realms artwork, which you can see here from Dave Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. um, this was put together as a, a kind of composite of lots of in-game 
uh, graphics from Repton, which you'll probably recognize things like the skull and the, the transporter that he's heading towards uh, and the things kind of flying out from it um, mm. are, you know, but each one of those is, is references uh, things from within the game itself. Uh, I think it's a really lovely cover, this one. Mm, yeah. Yeah, again, it's, it's punchy. Um, you got good colour on there and you got airbrush effects. And now I say you can see that there's a lot of recognisable pieces from the original. Yeah, I mean, it's it's in keeping with them. The other thing is when you look at the, the how incredibly clear it is, you just couldn't get that kind of effect 40 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, it is very, it's, it's very sharp, isn't it? Um, but in terms of the, the way that it's uh, sort of, if you like, marketed, it's again, it's another one that's inspired by, but this time by the sort of newer superior styling, as you say, Chris, where it's focusing on the one, the one game this time um, with both the artwork and the in-game uh, screenshots. Um, yeah, that, that, that advert that you've got there is, looks very familiar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it does, right? Because I think it's, uh, it's definitely, uh, definitely yes. uh, paying homage to this one, right? <laughs> it is, it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's. I mean, the only thing that I can say that's missing is the Repton lettering. Um, it could probably do with an outline, uh, a, a coloured outline on it. And then it'd be, you know, it doesn't have to be the same as what we did, but um, it, it just seems to, that it's missing the outline. And it also, it could, it would even, yeah, another thing that would even make it as well is a vignette. So yes. it's, it's the, the light yellow to the dark yellow in Repton 3 there. Mm. The other yeah. thing is what you don't notice is, and especially on the right hand side, notice how for the Commodore Amstrad BBC Microelectron, it fits the width of the lettering. Equally, the ultimate challenge underneath, it's the width of the lettering. So what you generally do on the left hand side is reduce the size of the BBC Micro and try and simplify, take a word out if possible. So it's the width of the green Repton. And then the Lost Realms, you could probably add like these um, red markers either side of the ultimate challenge to fill out the space, or you'd use a fatter, um, more headliney font for the Lost yeah. Realm to fill the width, what's called the width of the measure of the word Repton. But these are very tiny things. Yeah. Um, but really what is a very nice, very nice design. Mm. Yeah, I agree. There we go. So that's actually the going back to what we were discussing earlier, taking the artwork and then actually making it part of the the loader screen. There, yeah, lovely, is, is yeah, great, very nicely that. done. Yeah. yeah, like that a lot. Um, so this is another one I think inspired again by some of the later superior styling here. I love the this real character in the way. There's you see that character there where it's drawn. There's a movement in the character. You know the way. The way that it's the way she's holding it, if it's a man, it looks slightly feminine, but it, a very lovely angle the way they're leaning forward. So, very, very um, skilled illustrator here. And I love the pencil effect and the very rough coloring. I mean, I would happily employ that illustrator. Um, could, Colin, could you just mm. flick back a slide and oh, yeah. um, come back to this? Because I, sorry, or forward. I was updating it with a credit, and I put the credit now onto the Mountain Panic slide. Ah, you oh, yeah. Oh, it's not, oh, it's not oh, showing. Hang on. I might have to come out of it. Hang on. It's probably Are you on full not... screen? Yeah, there yeah. you go. So if I present that now, it should come back. There we go. Awesome. I, I don't know if Dave's on the call. I can't remember who did the in-game sprites. There was Roger Cohen, Chris Hogg, I believe, worked on the graphics, accredited on the back cover. One person designed the beautiful in-game sprites, the other did the artwork. I can't remember which was which. It was seven, eight years ago. But oh, oh, we yeah. knew the artwork. <laughs> to be honest, I can't remember it. myself it's anymore. Dave. Here's <laughs> Dave. So. Yeah, I can't remember myself anymore, Dave, to be honest. I think, I think Rog started and then Chris added a few after that. But it was certainly Chris that did the, the cover page there. Chris Hogg is the artist yes, then, yeah. is the, well, the, yeah, no, uh, the illustrator. And can get me in contact with him. I would love to see more of his work and see if I can use him in some way. I really like the ghost in the mountain. 
I, I didn't see it at first, but yeah. it's, uh, it's that, quite that's subtle. Yeah, very good, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, this is the artwork for Elementum, which is uh, Zero X Code's new game, uh, originally designed, well, specifically designed actually for the Electron. Um, and uh, yeah, as it says there, uh, the artwork from Samandera, I think, is that, is that the, um, Dave, is that their full name? I just need to open our Facebook chat up because I've got to get the pronunciation right. Um, <laughs> we'll come back to that. In terms of the inspiration for it um, as a design, uh, this one's actually based on well, as a kind of question question to the group. I think I think Mike knows and Chris probably knows. Yeah. So does anyone does anyone want to volunteer what the what the illustration might be that this one was based on, or, or inspired by? Let's say. Sorry, I'll reveal. <laughs> I went to click on the chat and it came up. Sorry, that's my yeah, that's my. That's okay. I was just about to guess that anyway. <laughs> So I recognize that the only thing is, is that the uh, Elementum game, the the, <laughs> the trays are a little flatter. The the uh, there's not too many wheels involved. <laughs> Indeed. So yeah, Felix Felix meets the evil weebles, which is uh, one of the ones we were looking at earlier. I know one thing that might be uh, is interesting is I have two sons, Toby, and my second son is Felix, and I have a feeling that I actually, one of the reasons my wife and I chose Felix, why I was so enthusiastic, was because of the three games, Felix games, I launched back in the mid-80s. <laughs> That's cool. Um, and the adverts for this, I think, have gone out um, both in English and in Italian as well. So you can see that the, the Italian edition next to it there. And uh, the original uh, game art, obviously on uh, game game screenshot, sorry, on the, on the right hand side as well. And Colin, if you again can refresh that slide, mm. there we go. You lose a screenshot, but you'll get a full credit. Maria Gorbanova. The H is pronounced with a G, apparently. So there you oh, go. Okay. And then these ones are uh, definitely inspired, aren't they, Dave? By some of the uh, some of the Micropower um, artwork from some of the some of their earlier uh, cover arts. Yeah, I'd say so. It's that it's the actual programmer David Body designed these inlays, and he was a bit worried when I told him I'm blowing this Castle Raid <laughs> design from ten years ago that he'd really only ever intended to go in a little cassette case, you know, into into a big sort of A5 style wallet. It panicked him a bit, but it looks good. It really looks good when you've got them in your hands. And I think what helps is the MicroPower branding as well. And we, we were talking with Chris yesterday. He liked how we've split off the format. We put the platform and the format at the bottom and left the title on its own. Well, um, it's, the wording I would use is it allows the title, like Class or Raider, to breathe. So you actually just see, because otherwise it would be four and the old micropower was too cluttered and ugly with the, um, the, the computer format as well, like BBC Micro. So this is a much improved, you know, certainly improved on what Ralph Senior Associates created. And then on the, the thanks, Chris, yeah, on the right hand side, Jungle Journey, um, the original artwork was ultimate inspired. So if, if people are familiar with the very, it's like a sort of a real cult favorite software publisher, Ultimate Play the Game, they went on to become Rare, which are now Microsoft, they bought by Microsoft. And they had a very unique style for their games like um, Jetpack and Nightshade, Night Law, Alienate, Attic Attack. So it's actually designed to follow the ultimate branding. Yeah, there we go. That's them with their uh, discs underneath as well. Very nice. And this is actually using the artwork, isn't it, on, on disc, disc boxes rather than on the tape inlays. So, Yeah, I think what, one thing I know is, and I count myself, class myself as a collector, that we, we like uniformity. So, <laughs> you know, all the BBC versions are blue. All the BBC Electron versions are purple etc so hmm. ah yeah now castle defender the artwork here has actually been um based on the based on the loading screen so it's almost like the reverse of of taking the artwork and making it into the loading screen here the loading screen is the inspiration for the artwork which is uh, an, a nice touch um so the loading screen by john blythe uh and then again uh, the uh, the artwork uh, by maria um for, same as elementum this is the first work Masha or Maria 
did for me the very first project somebody else did a bad job of this and i saw <laughs> masha specialized in landscape work sent her the screenshot she did a concept sketch but i'm guessing it's a lot easier now for her to make changes digitally back in the day it would have been harder to do that once you've airbrushed it oh yeah impossible Um, I think we've got Kenton on the uh, on the group call. I just wanted to get your get your reaction to the to the to the next slide that's coming up in the uh, in the deck. Um, so this is an exclusive reveal today uh, for for Hyper Viper, uh, which is uh, which is your game, obviously, and that, that's that's the uh, that's the artwork for it for retro, retro power. Yeah, uh, it's a bit of a ruined reveal because Dave kind of told me before and he forgot he'd already told me but i hadn't seen it before. <laughs> i've seen the logo i mean it I, I don't know if you know the backstory of this uh give you a little quick 30 second backstory of how this came mm -hmm. about it's a game that i completely forgot i wrote over a weekend and i gave dave my discs a few years ago and he found this game on them and i still don't remember ever writing it and it's basically a game that's a bit like snake about 10 yeah. years before nokia did it and um yeah, it's it is quite quite a fun little thing. And Dave asked me to open source it, and I said, "Yeah, all right." And then Keys just ported it to an Acorn Atom. And then on the 30th anniversary of the BBC, there's a video of Herman Hauser playing Hyper Vapor, a game I forgot he ever wrote on the Acorn Atom, which is a bit like I don't know if you're an Apple fan, sort of uh, Steve Jobs sort of playing your game. It <laughs> it was kind of like the most bonkers thing I've ever seen. So. It's been amazing, Dave, being this part of the archiving thing that he does of mm. sort of keeping all this stuff going. And I'm, I'm really grateful for him to do it, for doing it. And this is ever more insane what he's doing with this. So thank you very much. I really like the uh, the design of the text also on that hyper viper using the uh, using the snake as the uh, as the lettering. I think it's a really nice touch. Can I uh, can I uh, butt in here slightly? I just want to say something about what happened today since sort of um the book that came out and starquake was in it and me and ruben got very excited about what happened and uh we're basically going to try and redo starquake to fit in the stuff that now we're better programmers to sort of like actually sort of like <laughs> with better tooling to actually still fit the stuff in the 32k that had to be taken out back in the day and as part of that ruben's been working on an interactive browser-based uh, debugger and compiler and um, uh, it's quite extraordinary and unfortunately it wasn't ready to show today and as you may have known it was it was on the schedule for earlier this afternoon and really sorry that it couldn't go be shown but it's on the way and what I've seen of it is unbelievable you can do breakpoints in your code you can change your code year 6502 as you go it's going to be an amazing thing when it comes out sounds awesome it's, it's built on all the existing tools and it's going to be open source as well. So. Fantastic. He's too embarrassed to speak about it. He can speak about it <laughs> once, but <laughs> he's done an incredible job on this and it's just like a spare time thing, of course. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. It's an amazing thing for the community. Mm. Cool. Um, I think there's... One more that we were going to show in this uh, in this deck. So this is uh, Planet Nubium from uh, well Planet Nubium one and two uh, from Andrew Waite, and uh, again it's that artwork by uh, Maria here, uh, based on based, again based on the loading screen, um, but taken in, in as the artwork here for for both the first and second games. Um, pretty impressive. And uh, I think. If I'm right. Yes. Right. I'm not going to press any buttons this time, so I don't ruin it. <laughs> so uh, does anyone want to give a guess as to which superior software game might have inspired this cover art? Got a oh, message oh. From, 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 from Joe Myers uh, asking if it might be Exile. No, it, it was a... No. So it was a superior software game. It's probably around the same time, maybe a little later. But so Bill Carr's message me, um, it's uh, yeah, he's, he's got it right. So do you yeah. just what do you, it's a, I believe it. This is a LSI Sprouls uh, piece. But do you want to advance the slide? Yeah. There we go. Repton Infinity. You kind of once you see them side by side, it's kind of clear, right? <laughs> 
There we go. This is one of yours, Mike, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think in in closing uh, to both Chris and Mike, I'd say that um, whether you're into the sort of homebrew scene or not, I think it's it's true that the stuff that you did uh, together, you know, back in the eighties for both Micropower and Superior, is like it continues to inspire people now as far as um, not just the games themselves, obviously, but but the artwork and and the way that it's promoted. So. Um, I hope that's uh, I hope that's something that is uh, that makes you feel warm inside. <laughs> I don't know Joe, who obviously works, I think, with Microsoft now on on graphics and music. What do you think's lacking in today's visuals? Well, I mean, I, I still make them, so I can't say that um, <laughs> I'm lacking anything in what I, what I make, hopefully. But no, it's um, I mean, it's just yeah, there's that kind of it's a simplicity, right? At the end of the day, I really. I really enjoy making, I'm making a remake now effectively with Microsoft of, of Perfect Dark. And I played like uh, the, 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 the version of it that they did to work on the Xbox 360 and stuff. And, and it's, uh, it, you know, it was a different time. It was funny, like, yeah, that was so sophisticated at the time. And now what I'm making is crazy sophisticated in, in comparison, but there was a real nice simplicity of like only having a few people work on it at once. You didn't need that many artists on a, on a triple A game back in those days. And now I'm working with a team of, you know, at least well, in the office, at least a hundred people and, and whatever. So there was a, it was really nice. When I was making PS1 games, I don't, it would be like me writing all the music, doing all the artwork and even the animation. And now I could never do that. So it's, um, yeah, it's really nice to be able to think about the simplicity of the earlier stuff and be able to do so much of it with just a few people and how close you get with those people. So this is um, a, a game creation. Well, it was a basic language that came out in France called Stos Basic. And it, basically it is a, 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 a basic programming language for the Atari ST. And what it had was a, a couple of sprite commands and music stands fans. So you could set the sprite on a path and it would carry on automatically until you sent it to stop. And I thought it had sold about a thousand copies in the U in France. And I thought, oh my God, this should be renamed the Game Creator. So I got oh, yeah. Mike <laughs> to create this image. And um, with it's like a based on a Peter Cushing image. You created this, didn't you, Mike? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I've forgotten that I've fully recognize it now yeah and i did a basic oh. sketch of a guy in something in the center with music symbols going left and right and i had a, a robot for the bottom left and a character and a cartoon character for the bottom right and there was a cartoon movie called tony de peltry which some of you may have seen which is a pianist and i think the um the cartoon was created in the early 80s. And what happens is, as he's playing the piano in computer graphics, he pauses and his whole, this whole character breaks off and, flo and floats off every individual as an individual, like a leaf. And that is what we had in this here image. So this is where I did, we did, and I came up with this idea for the bottom one, which is the compiler, which compiled the um, uh, basic programming and Mike, we had this vague idea of moving left and right with the speed things and Les Ives and Stuart Sproul based on an image from, um, from, um, from Mike created this packaging for the Stoss compiler. I think you also did this, Mike, but you yeah. can see here that we did a 3D engine. So it was a 3D plugin for this basic programming and um, we created this image as well. And we added, you can see Stuart has done a colorized version of the Stoss logo. These did thousands of units. We eventually shifted well over a hundred thousand copies of this. So you can imagine this was a non-selling Stoss basic programming, basic in the France. We managed to launch it in the UK as my idea was a games creator and added in a sprite editor and a music editor, which were done very cheaply, and then did I mean, probably at least 150,000 units. 
What then came out of that was Amos, which was, we then did the Amiga version. Um, and again, actually, I've just realized Mike did the Amiga version. That's so Dave can show you the packaging for Amos. And then I got ousted from the business for political reasons. Uh, but then that went on to create PCOS, I think. There was a click and create came out of that. Uh, Dark Basic for Amiga. So a lot of the games languages came out of that with the same programmers. Um, so I was very involved in that kind of stuff. So maybe a few of you have even heard of this, but the main thing is you can see how some of the stuff that Mike and I did influenced some of the game creator packages later on. So thank you very much, Mike, for all you did there. And thanks for the, thanks for the little extra at the end too, Chris. <laughs> You're welcome.